First of all, let's consider the trial of Jesus. In both Mark and Matthew, none of Jesus' disciples are actually present at the hearings before the high priests or Pilate. Understanding this enormous credibility blunder made by Mark and Matthew, our present witness cleverly plants an unnamed disciple who conveniently knows both high priests, Annas and his son-in-law, Caiaphas, so that he is allowed into the thick of things, ostensibly so he can be an eyewitness of the dialogues and events. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest, and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. Why is this disciple not named? And why does our witness feel compelled to inform us that Peter gained access to the trials via this unnamed disciple, when both Mark and Matthew tell us explicitly that Peter did not gain access to the interrogations by the high priests? Our witness simply understood the problem of relaying details that none of the disciples could have been privy to, and so he corrected the problem by planting a disciple into the scene who could get Peter in to see the proceedings. You are quite clever, John, but I'm not done with you yet. I intend to prove that you were not an eyewitness. This same problem, that no one was there to observe these details, occurs in the Gethsemane scene where all the disciples are asleep, so no one was actually there to hear the words of Jesus' prayer. Our witness has also dealt nicely with this problem. He simply deleted the entire scene, but left us just enough to know that he had knowledge of the story, but decided to simply remove the details. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron, where there was a garden, into which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Not one mention of the incredibly moving Gethsemane details. No image of Jesus praying alone, asking his heavenly Father for some other way to accomplish salvation. This image of Jesus praying, present in all three synoptic gospels, is indelibly burned into our collective consciousness. Yet, for the sake of credibility, our witness has expunged it from his account. He had to for there was no way to insert a disciple into the scene in any believable way, since Jesus' prayer was between him and God alone. And having a disciple eavesdropping would rather destroy the solitary and lonely nature of the prayer. Well done, my friend, well done. But now let us consider further your clandestinely covert motive of planting eyewitnesses where the Synoptic Gospels had none. In the Synoptic Gospels, we are told explicitly that Jesus' acquaintances and family were watching from a long way off during His crucifixion. His disciples had all forsaken Him and were not present at all. The problem again arises then, who was there at the cross close enough to hear and witness the intimate details we are given in these Synoptic accounts? Ah, but our clever witness once again has recognized the problem and planted a disciple right at the foot of the cross along with several women so that at least one disciple could witness the intimate details of the crucifixion. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciple standing by, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Then we get to 1935, which we saw earlier. 
and he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. Touché, my friend, touché. You have planted a mystery disciple into two very crucial scenes and removed a third one altogether, nicely cleaning up the plot holes created by the synoptic fiction writers. But what about that glorious Sunday morning where in all three synoptic gospels, the women are the first to see the empty tomb, its contents, and Jesus himself? and all the disciples get to hear of it secondhand. Will you also plant a mystery disciple into the scene as corroboration that the tales are not mere hearsay? The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeing the stone taken away from the sepulchre, then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. I knew it and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, ha ha, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, well, obviously, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Well played, I must say. You've planted a mystery disciple into the scene again, where in the synoptics there were no disciples present at ground zero, only unreliable women, and you've ensured that since this mystery disciple made it to the tomb first, your testimony would carry an air of credibility. I must say, credit where credit is due, You've patched up a good many holes in the synoptics and bolstered the credibility of your eyewitness claim. Now, this theory of mine, that you've planted a mystery disciple into the scenes where you could and removed scenes altogether where you couldn't, it seems kind of plausible, doesn't it? But perhaps we need one more piece of evidence to help solidify the theory. In the synoptic gospels, Jesus is led into the wilderness, alone, I might add, in order to be tempted by Satan himself. If my theory is correct, there would be no good way to rewrite the scene and have a disciple present to vouch for the credibility. So the only recourse is to eliminate the scene altogether from our witness's testimony. Well, John, am I correct? One of the most memorable scenes in the life of Jesus, a scene found in all the other Gospels, is not to be found in your testimony. Again, bravo, sir, bravo. You have eliminated two of the most memorable scenes in the life of Jesus so that your credibility doesn't take an unnecessary hit. And what about that demon-possessed man living in the tombs by the sea? Jesus' disciples stay in the boat while Jesus converses with the demons alone, but this story is not to be found in your testimony either. In fact, none of Jesus' exorcisms from the synoptics are retold in your testimony. So maybe you have another reason for omitting all of those. Two other unforgettable events from the synoptics also are missing from your testimony. Matthew's Sermon on the Mount is unbearably lengthy, so I can't blame you for eliminating that one. Still, isn't it odd you supposedly were there, an eyewitness to the transfiguration, seeing with your very own eyes Jesus transforming into a glorified state with Elijah and Moses appearing to boot? But inexplicably, you say nothing about this in your own testimony. I find that almost impossible to believe. Unless you are not the son of Zebedee at all, and you didn't just plant a mystery disciple into the scenes. You are the mystery disciple. You've planted yourself into the scenes 
in order to give your gospel the air of credibility. A mystery disciple whom you yourself could plant at will into scenes where you could to ensure that you were there to witness the events. Just which disciple you were supposed to be? Well, you'd let the readers hash that one out for themselves. This being the obvious case indeed, you realized that you couldn't simply insert an unnamed disciple easily into the transfiguration scene like you did at the Last Supper and like you did at the trial of Jesus and like you did at the empty tomb because it would cause too many problems. Peter, James, and John were the big three and inserting yourself into the scene as a fourth disciple and an unnamed one at that would have drawn too much suspicion. Who is this unnamed disciple that keeps popping up in all of these scenes where the synoptics never even speak about him? And especially in this scene. What? This mystery disciple was on par with the big guns? Yet we are not even told his name? And he doesn't even appear at all in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels? No, you realized that that would not work. The simplest solution? Delete the scene altogether, as you did the Gethsemane scene, the temptation scene, the demon-possessed man scene, and others. But no one commits the perfect crime. At some point, my friend, you will certainly recount details that you did not personally witness. And when you do... In chapter 18, we are told that the Jews did not go into the judgment hall because they didn't want to defile themselves before eating the Passover. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Yet, this judgment hall is precisely where Jesus was scourged and mocked. So we know that you did not witness the scourging and mocking, yet you recount the details as if you were standing there watching Jesus get whipped. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Again, none of the disciples, including you, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the unnamed mystery disciple, were there in the judgment hall. Your account of the scourging is hearsay. And if I'm not mistaken, you make another little slip up late in your testimony. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Well, well, where is the beloved disciple now? Since you say that the disciples left the scene, that means no one but Mary was there to see the angels. Your testimony of this scene is now hearsay. You did not witness the angels. You did not witness Jesus appearing to Mary right after the angel visit. We now have two statements of provable hearsay so far. And we can find several more, not directly pertaining to the resurrection, but hearsay nonetheless. Here's one more example. And they came unto John, and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. Here we have the Pharisees inquiring of John the Baptist about why Jesus is now baptizing people. But Jesus nor his disciples are present. So how can the dialogue that transpired have been seen by our witness? More hearsay. So we've seen many scenes that contain obvious hearsay and perhaps even fiction, but since I can't definitively dismiss every verse as hearsay, as I did with Mark, Matthew, and Luke, I'll be willing 
to leave the hearsay box unchecked. Sure, it's abundantly clear that the actual author was not an eyewitness to any of it, as he deleted scenes where he couldn't insert himself and inserted himself where he could. But we have far too many other reasons to dismiss this witness as unreliable. And heck, I'm feeling kind of generous today. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. The concept of belief is stressed over and over in this gospel. I'd guess the word appears over 60 or 70 times in this one gospel alone. Clearly, the author has a bias toward Christianity. He has something to gain. He wants people to believe. He wants them to believe a lot. He's even altered the unanimous details found in the synoptics to improve his chances of convincing skeptics. He wants people to believe so much that he even invented a special scene at the end of his gospel where someone who doubted Jesus' resurrection became thoroughly convinced that it happened. The scene is found only in this gospel, and it's where we get the term doubting Thomas. Not only this, but he paints Jesus as encouraging people to believe in spite of any hard evidence. I think we are very safe to put a big fat X in the bias box and move on.